In 2018, she established the research data service in uh, UCC. So she really uh, walks the talk and uh, is now also the lead of the National Data Stewardship uh, North project, which is developing Sonary, the uh, stewardship network. And um, she's involved in a lot of other stuff as well, like um, uh, the chair of the Connell Research Group, um, the Resin uh, Network, and um, and the Research Data Alliance. And I'm so happy to uh, have you, Aoife, so thank you. Thanks, Aoife. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Sonry, the Airstay Stewardship Network today, and uh, give you a bit of a background about the project and our aims and ambitions for the future, because this is a new project, it's a new network, and we're uh, really in the beginning stages of getting it established. Um, so a little bit of context first. Um, the origins of the Irish Distributive Networks is really in uh, open research, open science, or open scholarship, however you want to refer to it. I'm using these terms interchangeably. Um, and it's in the, I suppose, data stewardship and is the background to it and the origins of the role is really embedded in the kind of proliferation of activities that have come from this uh, new way of doing research uh, that is open science. The definition I've used here is from our National Open Action Plan for Open Research produced by the National Open Research Forum in 2022. And it states that open research is also referred to as open scholarship, uh, open science or open scholarship, and is an approach to the scientific process based on open cooperative work, tools, and a diffusion of knowledge. Um, and within that, you have open scientific knowledge, you have open science infrastructures, dialogue with other knowledge systems, and also open engagement with societal actors, so citizen science and engaged research as well. And we heard from Susan that we uh, have really been working on open access as uh, open science um, engagement um, opportunity for quite a while now with the foundation of, of Ireland and the work throughout our, our libraries in terms of promoting open access. But really what we need to do now is move beyond open access to open science as a wider area of activity. And to kind of summarize the type of activities that fall in under open science practices, we have um, publications, open access publications, fair research data, open source tools and software, open um, workflows, citizen science, open educational resources, and also the need for a change in the way we're evaluating our research and, and outputs. Um, and what this means for the research community is significant change to workflows that some of them have had in place for decades, significant change to practices that they have developed over years, and also a new uh, skill set that our PhD students and new researchers and early research, career researchers need to learn. And that means a need for significant support in those activities because they don't necessarily have the skills that allows them to engage in all of these open science practices. Um, specifically, I suppose, when people think about uh, uh, data stewardship or research data stewardship, they uh, uh, come to open research data. So the data underlying scientific results is made accessible with no restrictions. Um, and what's interesting about open data is that it doesn't just move forward the open science agenda, but it is also intrinsically linked to things like research integrity, the accountability and transparency of the research that we're producing. And it is also very important for reproducibility, which again is becoming a very important factor within certain disciplines, specifically around clinical research, uh, applied psychology, social science, reproducibility crisis is very apparent in some of those disciplines. Um, and something that they wish to address as a discipline to improve the quality of the outputs that they're, they're working with. But open data, it doesn't specifically tell you how to make a data set open. It gives you some of the characteristics of, of a data set that could be reused. But within that, we need the FAIR principles, which actually come with a lot of technical language. 
they have a requirement for skills and a requirement for infrastructure that allows a fair a data set to become fair, to become reusable by a third party and be independent of the original researcher. And again, it's this is where data stewardship comes in as a profession or as a skills base. It's that need for enabling researchers to engage with FAIR. And if they can engage with FAIR, then there is the potential to have an open data set as well. And within the wider context, if we look at the kind of national and international context, pushes as to where this is coming from, the requirements to change your uh, outputs or how you produce your outputs as a researcher, there is in national and international pushes. So we have our national funders all now require a data management plan because they recognize that that's the best way to get a fair and open data set. We have our National Open Research Forum, which has set out very clear themes and objectives um, for 2030. We have Impact 2030, which continually references the quality of our research. Our national research integrity document also calls out research data management as a key part of um, our research in endeavours and a part of research integrity. Publishers are looking for more and more data sets underlying publications as a kind of a norm that if you want to publish in this journal, you need to make the underlying data available. And we have the Open Data Directive, which states that publicly funded research data should be open by default. Um, which is an interesting one that is not yet implemented, but is there in national legislation. And when you look at the European context and the international context, we see uh, this activity is all paralleled. Um, COARA has already been mentioned, the Coalition for Advancing Research Assessment, and that, again, has the potential to significantly move open science and open research forward. Uh, in terms of where we came from as a project, um, we are firmly embedded in North's history. Um, so the National Open Research Forum has been active since before 2019 and published the National Framework on a Transition to an Open Research Environment in July 2019. And it's through that document, really, that the SANRI project has, has come to life. Um, since then, there's been significant activity around the North. Many of the people in this room were involved in working groups, uh, involved in re reviewing documentation and outputs. Um, I suppose specifically in December 2021, there's a series of North policy briefs published, one of which called for the establishment of a national uh, data stewardship network to support the profession, to support skills development at a national level. Um, we applied for, I was chair of the group that produced that um, particular document, so I have a significant interest from the beginning in this project. Um, and we applied for funding in 2022. And that it was through that North funding call that uh, we were successful. And uh, that is kind of the origin of the Sonry project. We started officially in November 2022, although it did take us a little bit of time to get our ducks in a row and actually get going. Um, but I suppose official start date is November 2022 for Sonry. And when we look at the National Action Plan for Open Research. And when we were looking at it at the application stage to figure out, you know, where is the mandate to form a national data stewardship network, um, we could see that we are very firmly embedded within that plan and we can serve very clearly two of the three overarching teams and objectives. So establish a culture of open research and also enabling fair research data and other outputs. And those form the basis of our key aims for Sonry. Um, so as I said, we were one of six actions funded in, in 2022. Um, sorry, that slide's gone a bit funny, but anyway, um, the main message is still there. Since then, we've devised a mission statement and a, a vision, but actually these are still in draft form because we recognize that we want our community and our membership of the network to inform these going forward. But for now, our mission is to foster, enable, and advocate for the development of research data stewardship and data stewards nationally. Our vision is a sustainable and cohesive network of data stewards, uh, which will promote support um, the secure and effective management of our national data assets and the transition to a fair and open research uh, data landscape. Um, but I suppose to take a little bit of a step back, 
is why do data stewards or why does data stewardship need a national network? Um, and that's because data stewardship or being a data steward is not a widely recognized uh, career path or profession. The skills themselves sometimes can be called other names. Uh, people have very job titles. So now I'm just going to talk a little bit about what it actually means to be a data steward and who might we would consider as potential future members of this network. Um, so data stewardship in the context of research um, and in the context of this project is actually kind of ill-defined and that is at a European level as well. There's lots of groups working on defining it and building competency frameworks, but um, as yet, because it's a relatively new feature, it's not a clearly defined role or a universally defined role. So it's a catch-all term for numerous uh, support functions, roles and activities with respect to make, creating, maintaining and using research data. Um, and as a data steward, you can sit in various functions depending on the unit that you're working within. So you could be within the library, you could be in re with research services working on strategy and policy, you can be in a more technical role working directly on a data repository or sitting with IT services to help uh, active researchers with their data management or metadata uh, generation or choices. Um, and this diagram comes from a report from the, the Dutch national context, and I think it kind of breaks it down quite well in terms of the broad areas of data stewardship. So you have this policy strategy and coordination, you have universal and advice and training, and then you have embedded and operational. Now, in my role, I'm research data coordinator within the university. I probably uh, would sit kind of um, uh, as, as you're looking at the diagram towards the left hand side and the overlap between policy strategy and coordination and universal and advice. But the main message here is that to be a data steward, your role is uh, significantly influenced by the functional unit in which you sit. So that means that we would, Sonry would be quite a broad church in terms of the types of people we would expect to be members and also their backgrounds um, to be quite diverse and varied. Some of them coming from ICT, some from libraries, some from research. And this is reflected in the kind of titles and competencies when you, uh, uh, the job titles when you look across them. So this is a quick survey that I did of uh, roles which are similar to mine um, and also more embedded data stewardship roles over the last few years. And you can see that there's lots of different types of job titles. That actually creates a little bit of a problem because you have to ask the question, does job title matter when defining role, remit and scope of that role or the responsibilities held underneath that role? It also can create a little bit of confusion for people who might want to enter into the data stewardship sphere because they're wondering, looking at a job title, does my, do my skills translate? Do they transfer to this new role that's coming up? I think I want to be a data steward, but you know, would I fit in as a research support professional? Is that what they're looking for? Um, and I think that that, because it's an emerging profession, is something that Sonny needs to work on and help people with in attracting people to the roles. Again, because it's such a broad church currently, if you look at competency areas that have been identified um, in the published literature, you can see it's really broad. You're going from policy and strategy to alignment with the FAIR principles, to infrastructure, working on a repository, to networking, to archiving of data. Um, so, and I think that what we need to do, maybe nationally, and Sonnery needs to do nationally, is socialize this idea of data stewardship and allow the natural breaks within the community to form so that we have this spectrum of data stewardship skills, all of which are enabling open research and enabling researchers to engage with um, open science, open scholarship, and fair data production. Um, and again, this is kind of making the same points again, because when you look at the research data life cycle and you look across it, the activities that you might engage in as a data steward 
will vary depending at which point in the research data life cycle you're um, embedding yourself within or you're acting on or you're supporting. So generally in my role, I support uh, pre-award data management plans and I do some advisory and consultancy on implementation of those data management plans. And then I step out while the actual research has been conducted and I'm not embedded within the project. I always sit outside it. But you do get data stewards, and we have an example, Dr. Deborah Thorpe within ECC Library, and she is embedded within the project. She works directly with those researchers on a more regular basis, uh, helping them to get towards a point where they have uh, really good quality data, but also data that can be archived as fair and open data. Um, so coming back to those open research practices, in light of, you know, data stewards can be involved at various different points throughout the research data life cycle, they can also be involved in other aspects of open research or open science. They're not just about fair and open data because if you want open source software and tools and you want to engage in that, you need to think about if I'm developing a tool, how do I archive that post-project? How do I make that available to my peers long-term if I want to have a reproducible data set? Um, if you have open workflows, how do I make them open? Where do I share them? What are the right platforms that I use? Am I using the open science framework or am I archiving a version of my workflow with my data? Again, a data steward can help with those decisions. Citizen science, again, very interesting. I work in a project in UCC called Erica on engaged research. A big problem with engaged research is when materials are co-developed with communities. What happens to those materials after the project is completed? How do we continue to make them accessible if it's a website or an app or a tool or an infographic? And again, your friendly neighborhood data steward can help with these decisions or can help you design artifacts coming out of your project that are archivable from the beginning and remain available long term to those groups that you're working with. Open educational resources, again, a really amazing kind of um, outcome of open sciences. Um, educational resources, textbooks that don't cost hundreds of euros um, that are available, but how do we make them available in a sustainable way? One example I always think of is, you know, the MOOCs. There was a proliferation of MOOCs. There was an open science MOOC that has largely, uh, unfortunately, dwindled into um, something that's a little bit out of date now because the group working on it weren't able to sustain it long term because the, the PI of the project, unfortunately, um, died. So how do we make these open educational resources available long term? How do we build in sustainability to our activities? And then we come to another, not open research practice, but something that is aiming to uh, shift the paradigm of how we evaluate research, how we, uh, what metrics we are using. And when I talk about engaging in open research and, and, and advocating for engaging open research as part of my role within UCC, I also have to be very cautious because a lot of the activities I'm suggesting to early career stage researchers, to PhD students to engage in are not yet valued within career progression for those people. They're not yet valued in grant applications, although that is changing coming from the funders. So, you have to be careful in terms of how much time they're going to put into it and how gung-ho they're going to get into open science and encourage them to you know, be balanced in your approach. And that's because our research metrics don't yet recognize open science activities or value them in the way that they should or value them uh, in a way that is reflective of the amount of time and the changes you have to make to your research workflows um, to uh, engage with them effectively. Um, so I think Sonri definitely has a role there in supporting the activities and the institutions that are getting involved in Koara and trying to make that shift to how we evaluate research. Um, and what Koara is asking for is for cultural shape change, a cultural shift. This diagram was produced by Brian Nosek, who's one of the founders of the Open Science 
framework, which is a significant piece of infrastructure um, in, in, in open science. And I think it's it's really interesting, and I think it's it's quite an accessible way to think about what we're asking for when we say we need a cultural change, we need a cultural shift to enable open research or open science. We have some of the policies, you know, we have quandary policies requiring data management plans that are uh, aiming to help engagement with um, open research. Uh, GDPR is also there. Research integrity is also there. Um, publisher policies, institutional policies. We are building a policy uh, landscape, making a lot of these activities required for researchers. Um, but we don't yet have the incentive, so it's not yet rewarding. So that means that sometimes doing a data management plan to get you to fair and open data is a tick box exercise. And we need to move beyond that. But then where does Sanri come in? Sanri is about building communities and building a network um, to support the, the culture change. Um, but it also comes in as well, I think, you know, uh, in terms of making it easy, making training and support available. And that's another place where Sanri can, can insert itself into this uh, national culture change and international culture change that we're asking our researchers to engage in. Um, so how are we going to do this? Um, so these are kind of the four pillars of activity that we have broken the project down into. Um, the first one is recognition. So the recognition of the need for data stewardship and raising the profile of data stewards. So this is something, you know, I started in 2018 and we've been working locally in UCC. But it's still there's still a job of work there to do to socialize this idea across our research communities so that they're allowing time when they're putting budgets together for somebody to work on data stewardship. So they're engaging with the library early on this. So they're engaging with IT services on this. So they're engaging with ethics. So they're allowing for fair and open data sharing if they need ethical approval, but also to raise the profile of those existing data stewards within institutions. So that people know who the point of contact is, but also so all of those data stewards know who the data stewards are within the neighboring institution. So we have a network and a group to talk to. When I started, it was a very lonely place to be a data steward. I was the only research data coordinator um, and there was very few others doing this role. But now there's more and we need a platform through which we can communicate and talk and arrange trainings and have meetings like this, like LER, librarians coming together, a, a, a platform that can bring data stewards together. Which brings me on to the next point, support for data stewards through networking, uh, communication, thanks John, uh, and peer learning. Um, again, bringing people together so we can learn from each other, so we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, but also to create, you know, opportunities for, um, you know, learning about other different types of data stewards, learning about other different types of uh, institutions and how services are rolled out there, so we can have maybe shared resources. Professionalization of the role of data stewards within the research landscape. Um, for me, I think this is, is, is quite important. Um, if you are in a profession that isn't, doesn't fit into any box neatly, it makes career progression quite difficult. Within the Netherlands, they have recognized the role of data stewards within their national pay scales. And I think that makes a difference for them um, in terms of um, job descriptions, but also progression as well. Training and skills development for professional data stewards so that there is, uh, you know, training courses, Lehrman's training courses for, for librarians. It'd be great to see a training series for data stewards as well. And this is actually a discussion that I've had with colleagues, not just in HEIs, but in the CSO, in the National Council Registry, with TUSLA, who are also interested and recognize that data stewardship is something that their employees are, are engaging in, but there isn't a natural group for them in terms of, um, you know, arranging training courses or professional development for those people. But also we need to address uh, raising the skill levels of the whole research community so that they are aware of the needs of data stewardship for their own research and know when to engage a professional when it's required. Um, so I'm pretty much done. I just want to finish up on what we're going to do next. Um, as I said, we've been kind of live for, for a year now. Um, next year, what we're going to do is we're going to do, be doing a series of interviews with data stewards across the whole spectrum of data stewards, but also 
uh, we're going to talk to researchers, we're going to talk to research funding organizations and uh, really get, uh, you know, a detailed picture of what people want from this network. Um, we'll also be announcing a formal membership structure early in 2024 and that will be open for consultation from the wider community. So I hope you'll, you'll contribute at that point. And we have a conference planned. Oh, I found a typo. It should say spring, summer 2024, not 2023. We haven't learned how to time travel yet, unfortunately. Um, and that will be happening a two day event. So we can hopefully kind of start to bring this emerging community together um, and start to coalesce around the idea of data stewardship. One thing I also want to leave with you as well, and something that Sanri hopes to support and aid is, we'd really like to see grassroots groups forming within individual institutions. In ECC, we've got the Fair Data Forum, which is an open forum for peer learning. We bring researchers together. Sometimes we have small talks on various different topics related to data, data management, and it's, it, it's proving quite successful. And I think that that's a really good way as a data steward within an organization to figure out where the pinch points are and communicate directly with your researchers. Um, so I'll leave it at that. And uh, any questions? Thank you for listening. Do we have any questions, Liam, from online? No? OK. So any questions down here? A lot of echoing going on. Lovely. Now, you have to speak into the mic. Sorry, just uh, say your name. Uh, Frances Martin from TU Dublin. Um, with regard to the membership, is that something you're imagining as a kind of paid for model or is it more of a informal network? Sorry, could you repeat that? Like an see. echo? So. The membership. The membership. Like, do, are you imagining that as a plan for how are you planning on that being organised? <laughs> membership. Membership. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, turn this off. So our ideas around the membership. So I think that our governance structure will be a steering group, a committee, and then we will have task and finish groups uh, forming out of that based on specific topics. In terms of the formal membership of the organization, it's something that we're looking at. It probably won't be individual membership because that's very hard to manage, administer and, and maintain. It likely will be an institutional script subscription where then anybody within that institution can probably come along to training sessions for free or at a discount rate. We have good examples like Ler and Connell where that works very well for, for members. So I think that's probably the lines are gonna to go to, but um, it is all up for, for conversation. So if anybody has a new and radical membership model that they want to suggest, we'd be happy to hear. Uh, the training of the data stewards, what sort of training do we visualize? Is it online training or what? Um, so I think we would probably consider um, a mixture of both. Um, we would like to bring in experts from the wider research data community um, uh, within Europe or internationally um, to run kind of master classes or classes on specific topics. Um, and that would be maybe for the professional data steward. We'd love to say we have a budget to, for people to come over and do in-person training as well. But I guess that depends really on funding uh, and budget. In terms of training for researchers, um, there is another North project, which uh, its name is gone right out of my brain, but it's run by Dermot Lennett out of Manuk. And they are looking at carpentry style um, outputs where there's train the trainer um, type materials available and that you would be able to pick those up and use them within your own research community or, or, or adapt them to that. So we will link in with Dermot's project and, and make sure whatever we do is kind of in concert with that. Thanks. Yeah. David just said it's tropic. Tropic, that's it. Thanks, David. Thank you.